Another dangerous encounter with a drone. An unmanned aircraft forces an LAPD helicopter to take evasive action while searching for a suspect. Eyewitness News reporter Darcia Phillips is live in downtown LA with the latest incident in a series of unsafe encounters between drones and police and firefighting aircraft. So, well, uh, drones used to be military weapons, and now they're recreational toys and things that pilots have to watch out for in the sky. An LAPD chopper pilot had to take evasive action after a drone came too close to his aircraft. That drone was confiscated. The operator wasn't charged with the crime, and that's because drones aren't really regulated. Lawmakers say they want to change that. The growing popularity of drones and the confusion over what rules operators are supposed to follow has led to many drone enthusiasts landing in handcuffs. This man was briefly detained early this morning after officials say his drone flew too close to an LAPD chopper that was assisting in a search for a wanted suspect. The drone operator was questioned and then released. Drones have also posed a serious problem in wildfire zones. Firefighting aircraft have been hampered from making drops over fires, most recently in the Cajon Pass blaze that jumped the freeway. There's also privacy concerns when it comes to drones. This video shows a man swatting a drone down after telling the operator not to fly near his home. Lawmakers are working to clarify the rules, proposing state legislation that would make it a crime to fly private drones near wildfires and 350 feet above private property. <laughs> Officials hope laws like these will keep drones from putting the public and pilots in danger. I am Alan Armstrong, a licensed commercial pilot and active aviation lawyer with experience in air crash litigation. And I am Lydia Hilton, a lawyer with experience related to unmanned aircraft systems, commonly called drones. As a public service announcement of the aviation section of the State Bar of Georgia, Lydia and I are going to review with you today some of the operational and legal aspects presented by the introduction of unmanned aerial vehicles into the national airspace system. It is not our intention to give you specific legal advice for a particular legal problem. However, it is our intention to make operators of unmanned aerial vehicles, both recreational and commercial, aware of the potential hazards associated with the operation of these devices. After Alan discusses the concerns and dangers of unmanned aircraft to pilots and manned aircraft, I will discuss how recreational users or hobbyists may safely and legally operate small unmanned aircraft for personal enjoyment. The rules that apply to using drones for business purposes are beyond the scope of our discussion today. The national airspace system in the United States is governed by rules and regulations promulgated by the Federal Aviation Administration. The FAA was created by an act of Congress in 1958 in the wake of the collision of two airliners over the Grand Canyon. The FAA has air traffic control centers and approach control facilities throughout the United States manned by trained air traffic controllers who are skilled and experienced in separating aircraft from other aircraft and aiding aircraft in avoiding hazardous weather and restricted airspace. Aircraft operating the national airspace system may operate under either instrument flight rules, IFR, transmitting a discrete transponder code, or under visual flight rules, VFR, generally transmitting a code of 1200. The transponder code for the aircraft appears as a data block in conjunction with the aircraft's target on the air traffic controller's radar scope. With very few exceptions, virtually all aircraft operated in the national airspace system have transponders. The transponder code transmitted from the aircraft allows air traffic control to positively identify a particular aircraft and communicate with the pilot of that aircraft. This allows air traffic control to provide assigned headings to aircraft pilots and issue traffic alerts to pilots in the event another aircraft presents a collision hazard. It also allows controllers to direct manned aircraft to avoid prohibited, restricted, or special use airspace. While pilots are trained to see and avoid other aircraft, 
Even IFR and VFR aircraft may be separated by vectors issued from air traffic control. So air traffic control is an additional layer of safety provided to pilots in the national airspace system to prevent mid-air collisions. Not only do aircraft participating in the national airspace system have the benefit of transponder codes that are depicted on air traffic control radar scopes that allow ATC to separate aircraft and give aircraft directions to avoid a potential mid-air collision, but increasingly aircraft are equipped with ADSB, which is Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast. ADSB is a way that pilots of aircraft can receive an electronic depiction of the position of other aircraft in their vicinity in terms of bearing, distance, and altitude, and thereby avoid a collision with other aircraft. In addition, most jet aircraft have Terminal Collision Avoidance System, or TCAS, that identifies other aircraft that pose a threat to the aircraft by virtue of their heading, speed, or altitude. The TCAS will issue a traffic alert to the flight crew along with a resolution advisory to climb, to descend, or to alter course to avoid the collision with another aircraft. And the concerns that we as pilots have about the emerging proliferation of unmanned aerial vehicles into the national airspace system is that these devices do not have transponders. They are not depicted on air traffic control radar scopes. They do not have ADSB, and they are not detected by TCAS. So we as pilots cannot detect them in our aircraft. A typical single engine aircraft will be traveling at a speed of 160 knots or 184 miles per hour, which is about three miles a minute. Because of the small size of a typical unmanned aerial vehicle, it is highly likely that at this closure speed, the UAV will impact the aircraft before the pilot ever sees it. In the event there is a collision between a light aircraft and a small UAV or drone, the result for the pilot and the passengers could be catastrophic. Even in the case of an airliner, we know from experience that a 12-pound goose striking an aircraft at a velocity of 150 miles per hour generates the force of a 1,000-pound weight dropped from 10 feet. UAVs operated in the United States which may weigh up to 55 pounds can cause devastating damage to either a light aircraft or to an airliner. According to the Federal Aviation Administration, each month it receives more than 100 reports from pilots and others who spot what appears to be an unmanned aircraft flying close to an airport or a manned airplane. It becomes a serious safety concern for the agency and a potential security issue for the Department of Homeland Security. That's why the FAA has rules for operating unmanned aircraft. The rules differ according to how the drone is used. The FAA classifies operation of drones into one of three categories. Public use is used by a governmental authority, for example, by the military for intelligence gathering or by sheriffs or public safety for search and rescue. Civil use means using drones for commercial or business uses. And the third use is for purely personal and recreational purposes. UAS operated for these purposes are model aircraft. I will be talking primarily about the use of UAS for personal and recreational purposes. Only drones weighing less than 55 pounds can be flown. Drones are considered aircraft for purposes of FAA regulation, for insurance purposes, and for applying many legal rules and laws. Before flying a drone outside, you must register with the FAA. Who must register? All owners of drones who are 13 years of age or older. If the owner of the drone is under 13, then someone who is at least 13 years old must register. The owner must be a U.S. citizen or a legal permanent resident. What are their exceptions? The owner does not have to register if the drone, including anything added to it, weighs less than 0.55 pounds, which is about 8.8 .8 ounces. 
The FAA website has pictures of drones that weigh less than 0.55 pounds, so you can see what they look like. So what are the consequences of not registering? People who do not register could face civil and criminal penalties. Where do you go to register? You go online to the FAA's website at faa.gov forward slash UAS forward slash registration. Anyone who owns a drone that he intends to fly for business or commercial reasons, and that means for any other reason than for purely personal enjoyment and recreation, must also register. This too can now be done online. Once registered, the FAA will issue the owner a unique registration number, which must be affixed to each UAS owned. The website explains how to put the number on the UAS and how to add or delete UAS to or from the owner's registration. If the UAS is to be used for any other purpose except for purely recreational use, then each drone will be assigned its own separate unique identification number that must be attached to each UAS. Now that the UAS has been registered, just one more thing before I discuss safely and responsibly operating it for recreational purposes. There is presently no requirement that you obtain insurance to cover damage caused by the drone. A drone or UAV is an aircraft. Typical homeowner's insurance policies will probably not cover damage caused from the homeowner's operation of aircraft, that is the drone. In fact, most homeowner's policies specifically exclude coverage for damage or injuries caused by the policyholder's operation of aircraft. Check with your insurance carrier if you have questions. Now for the rules for safe operation when your drone is being operated solely for recreational purposes. There are in the U.S. a number of community-based organizations dedicated to flying model aircraft. The groups have existed for decades and have a long history of safety. These organizations, such as the Academy of Model Aeronautics, have developed rules to be followed whenever flying model aircraft. When you are operating model aircraft within the safety program of a community-based organization, such as at an organized event or at an area designated for flying by one of these organizations, then the rules of that organization must be followed. Those rules are available from each organization. The rules for the Academy of Model Aeronautics are found at www.modelaircraft.org. If you are not participating in a community-based program, then the following are the rules and guidelines and good practices. Don't fly aircraft that weigh more than 55 pounds. Remain well clear of and never interfere with manned aircraft operations. You must see and avoid other aircraft and obstacles at all times. Before flying within five miles of an airport, you must contact the airport and the air traffic control tower and tell them where and when you are flying. In order to know if you are within five miles of any such airports, you will need to download the FAA app called Before You Fly. It's available both in Android and Apple operating systems. Put your location into the app and it will tell you if you are within five miles of an airport. You must keep your drone in sight at all times and use an observer to assist if needed. UAS may not be flown beyond the line of sight. Line of sight means what can be seen with a natural eye, unaided by anything other than corrective lenses or glasses. This rule also means that you cannot fly at night. You can fly up to, but no higher than 400 feet above the ground, and you must remain clear of any surrounding obstacles. Do not intentionally fly over unprotected persons or moving vehicles, and stay away from individuals and vulnerable property. Stay clear of stadiums. Don't fly in adverse weather conditions, such as in high winds or reduced visibility. Don't fly under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Don't fly near or over sensitive infrastructure or property, such as power stations, water treatment facilities, correctional facilities, heavily traveled roadways, 
government facilities, and the like. Check and follow all local laws and ordinances before flying over private property. Do not conduct surveillance or photograph persons in areas where there is an expectation of privacy without the individual's permission. Ensure the operating environment is safe. Also take some lessons and learn how to operate your UAV safely. What happens if you don't follow the rules? Violations of the rules can be reported to the email address and the telephone numbers on the FAA's website or to local law enforcement. The FAA can always impose fines or other punishment for the careless or reckless operation of UAS, even if no one is hurt. You are also required to follow all regular laws of your city and county. If an activity is illegal if done when not using an unmanned aircraft, then it's still illegal when using one. Respect your neighbors, and above all else, stay away from manned aircraft. Finally, if you have questions, the place to begin is with the FAA's website. And while I recognize and appreciate Lydia's enthusiasm about the potential for commercial operations of unmanned aerial vehicles, as a pilot who operates in the national airspace system, I hope this presentation engenders an appreciation to unmanned aerial vehicle operators, even those who operate only for recreational purposes, about the hazards an errant drone operation can present to a manned aircraft. Thank you for allowing Lydia and I to provide you with our comments today.